I'm Rebecca Ford from The Hollywood Reporter, and I'm joined tonight by Guillermo del Toro, director of the show. And Vanessa Taylor, the So, um, I'd like to kind of kick things off with uh, where this idea first came from, what was sort of the first spark for bringing this to life? Well, the very, very earliest spark came when I was six years old. <laughs> and I was on a Sunday uh, watching uh, a TV program, uh, uh, Channel 6 in Guadalajara, and the uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon came on. And I was watching it, and, and I saw the image of Julie Adams in the white right, right bathing suit swimming, and the creature swimming underneath it. And at age six, I fell in love with Julie Adams, I fell in love with the creature, and I fell in love with them being in love. And, and I, I really, truly believed they were going to end up together. And it took 46 years to correct the mistake. <laughs> but but it was, that was the start. And then in 2011, I, was, I tried to go out the store in many ways, so thematically it would do what I wanted it to do, with the idea of the other and, and the purity of, of uh, emotion, love, and, and I couldn't find it. And then in 2011, I was having breakfast with Daniel Krauss, whom I co-wrote Troll Hunters with, and he said, I have this idea about a janitor that finds this amphibian creature in a secret government facility and takes it home. I thought, I thought that's the entrance, the service entrance, the, inv the invisible people, you know, the ones that clean the toilets in the secret government facility. That's the way to go in, uh, people without boys, without disability, and so forth. So, so Vanessa, tell me uh, how you came aboard the project and why you felt like this is a story you wanted to work on. Um, let's see. Uh, I obviously heard about it from Guillermo, and I have to say it, it felt so fully realized even the first time I heard the story. Um, and I just, from the very beginning, I loved the story, and I really saw it and I also just thought what an opportunity to work on something with someone who obviously loves it and is passionate about it and has a very very clear vision of what they want and um, seems to be in love only with the story and there didn't seem to be any of the other concerns that sometimes um, get in the way and I just thought that was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And Guillermo of course you are the master of monsters we've all fallen in love with different creatures you've brought to the big <laughs> screen but uh, what makes this one special to you? Well, I, I've always, you know, what attracts me to monsters, uh, and I've said this before, is, is an almost religious kinship I have with the figures. I, to me, when people say, what genre do you work on? And I don't know. I just do fables or fairy tales or parables that utilize this vernacular, you know? I'm not interested in the scares or the this or the that. I'm interested in the beauty of, of this. Uh, and I think it's also, by default, it's a very political uh, genre. And when you side with the monsters, it's a very simple and clear political stance. And, and, and the way you're creating in this movie, this character, uh, the difficulty. This is a triple somersault type of movie and script. And, and execution is very difficult. And it is dependent on, uh, technically, very much on that uh, character because he's not a creature, he's a leading man. Mm -hmm. And even if you were hiring an actor, the range that character needs, innocence, power, uh, divine nature, rage, ferocity, that range on an actor is difficult. Now sculpt that actor, paint that actor, and light that actor. And uh, I think this is from the start, I said I want the Michelangelo's David of amphibian men. <laughs> that I would need to create the most beautiful creature. And, and you know, I invested my own uh, money. I invested my entire salary, of course. I always try to do that. I'm a terrible businessman. <laughs> but but, but I, I also invested uh, uh, money from my own pocket. Even when we were uh, first talking about working together, I said, you, you'll work with me. Uh, because I, I wanted the freedom to go anywhere with this project. I wanted to land it in the right place. And we spent two years designing the creature and one year executing it. So three years were necessary. And I, I could bore everyone by explaining what we did. But it's, it's basically you're writing with images in this character. And it's a very delicate exercise. Yeah. 
So tell me about the actual writing of the script. I know you, you wrote for certain actors in this. Can you tell me a little bit about how that came about? When we got together, I had scenes and I had a, the, the beat sheet and I had the story, blah, blah, but um, I, I, if I may uh, clarify one thing that is very important for me. A, a lot of people assume that the gender breakout would be that she writes the sappy stuff, I write the hard stuff. It's the opposite. <laughs> And when, when we started collaborating, my, my kinship with Vanessa was the fact that she was incredibly um, good with plot. She basically reformed stuff to accommodate the Russian spies, the plot, the complot and all that. And the process, uh, to me, uh, I have a very, very strange process in writing. I write the biographies of the characters first and then I, I concentrate on a few scenes until I get them right. Like Ben's Labyrinth took six months for me to write the first ten minutes and then four weeks to write the rest of the script. <laughs> you know, and in this one I had, I, when I came to Vanessa I said, it's incomplete and she said, it needs the Russian, we need to flesh out the Russians. And I, immediately it made sense because that brought the Cold War to the forefront, which was relevant to the love story, relevant to identity, relevant to everything. Um, and you wrote for Sally and Michael yes. Shannon. Shannon, listen, I think when you write for an actor, uh, and I said this to Sally repeatedly when she got nervous on the set because it's an incredibly difficult part, mm -hmm. and I said to her, look, I wrote a song for you, for your range, for your voice, for your tone. Don't be afraid, you know, it's, 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 it's written for you, it's a song. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, the delivery of, of, of that character that has no lines and yet I gave her a monologue, you know, I said, the first thing I said, I'm going to create a monologue and that monologue, which I cannot discuss without choking up, really, was the crucial point for the character. With, with I write, when I cast and I write for the actors, I write for the eyes, because a lot of people think an actor is somebody that delivers great lines. And to me, an actor is someone that listens, and someone that looks, you know? The lines, like now, I'm, I'm talking, but I'm feeling the chair under my butt, I'm, my pants are too tight, I'm too fat. That's my reality, you know? The lines are secondary. They're important musically and they're important in information and tone and tonally for the film. But she is so great because of that. And Michael Shannon and Octavia and Doug Jones, they were all written specifically for them because it's a musicality of their eyes and their delivery, humanity, uh, above everything else. All of them can deliver a very human character in spite of the flaws. And Vanessa, tell me about um, when you have a story that has sort of these magical elements to it, how do you make sure it also stays grounded and relatable? Well, something that I was really excited by the first time Guillermo told me the story was that it was this period project and that it was also a fairy tale. And so it had these interesting sort of very interesting specificity to me. Um, and so the whole time I just sort of, and I, I felt like Guillermo had it so well visualized in a sense, that it almost was sort of a narrow target in a way that was helpful. You know, I just kept thinking, okay, just play in the same sandbox, <laughs> just be in the same sandbox. And it, I, I don't know, to me it all sort of made sense. The very first time he told it to me, I thought, oh right, I get it, it's this fairy tale, and I, I don't know, it just, I, I don't know, it seemed, it, it had a logic to me. There is a thing that was curious, because uh, this is the first movie I've written in English that I'm proud of the dialogue, you know, because I, what I did, what I decided was to have in a loop the documentary salesman, you know, the beautiful documentary salesman on a loop while I was writing, uh, you know, the dialogue that I was writing, then Vanessa and I have a, had a deal that we would rewrite each other mercilessly. She threw away scenes that I had written, and I go, I'm going to put it back, or vice versa. I took it away and said, and she would say, no, 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 let me explain why we need it. But the dialogue, uh, the patois, and, and the way they spoke in the 60s, you know, uh, whether the, the way they cursed, you know, uh, you know, uh, it was very important that I 
it felt natural, it felt real, and is. I'm really, really proud of, of the lines, and I'm really proud of the tonal shifts of the screenplay. This was very hard to write because it needed to service musical comedy, thriller, Douglas Sermon, or drama. It's really hard to do the pedal shifts on the script and write the characters so that they work across the board. And this, this is very challenging to, to make sure that they, everything can exist in, under the same script. Tell me about something that was maybe in an early draft that you either had to sacrifice or you're glad you changed to make it uh, work in the end. Well, I'll actually talk about something that, well, I guess it was in an early draft and I kept not, anyway, I'm not really a voiceover person. And so from the beginning I was like, voiceover, why do we need this? You know, I don't understand really what it's saying and it just, you know, I just don't get it. And then the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so you wanted the voiceover. Well, yes, because uh, it's a fairy tale. I mean, first of all, all my, mo all my movies open and close with voiceover. All of them. And it's not a process I do consciously. But I, the poem at the end destroys you. It completely is like a nuclear oh. weapon. <laughs> and it, it, is, it is, and the opening sets up the tone. Because the, the thing is, once upon a time in America in 1962, there was a woman. You know, it is, it is, 62 is today. 62 is where the American dream crystallizes and dies. Is the, the affluency of the, the post-war affluency, a suburban life, uh, jet fin cars, automated kitchens, the space race, Camelot in the White House, and then uh, Kennedy assassinated, the Vietnam War escalates, disillusionment sets in, but that negative space, that negative space in 62, that is all about the future, is the perfect setting, and the Cold War is the perfect setting for a love story and an ancient creature that comes from the past. And that negative space also, in, in the thematic that is about the other, and embracing the other as opposed to rejecting it, is perfect because I think sometimes when people talk about making America great again, they're dreaming about that myth. Mm. It was a Madison Avenue constructed dream. It was never real, never real. And it never real if you were not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male. Mm. And the rest of the, the people didn't get that great a deal, you know? Damn <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. You mentioned you're uh, especially proud of the dialogue in this film. What and so many of these characters have such great detail to them. Do you find inspiration in real life from people around you, or is it all from historical? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you you constructed. I write every character in a way that I can recognize that character. You know, I I I I've been in a studio meeting exactly like Strickland has with the general. You know. <laughs> Not the exact language, but the same emotion. <laughs> you know, I, the bad guy needs to be written. And a lot of the speech is Vanessa. That speech particularly, uh, uh, you know, it, it was first conceived by her and delivered by her. And I think it immediately struck me that it was great to give that guy that moment. But uh, in writing, I, I knew the Matrix as a student of Vegas. I knew the Matrix I was looking was Beauty and the Beast. but. I wanted to make clear that the female character, uh, for political, for every reason, I didn't want her to be a, a, a Disney princess. Mm. I wanted to open, because I think the loneliest place you can put a gender or a person is a pedestal. It's as horrible as putting them in a dungeon. Mm. They won't survive, they'll fall. Mm. And I thought it's important for me to say, to say very briefly, in the first five minutes, uh, she drinks of water, she has three minutes to boil eggs, three minutes to masturbate, and three minutes to shine her shoes. Mm -hmm. So it's real, you know? But she lives above a theater, and she likes musicals, and, 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 and have this flow of information that was surprising, because it's something you don't see most in cinema, although everybody practices it, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and I think it was important to say, this is not gonna be the normal beauty, and the beast will never turn into a prince. Because I think that a story of love that demands change is horrible. I think you take them as they are or let them be. <laughs> Good marriage advice. <laughs> uh, was there ever anything in the film that at a certain point maybe an executive or someone else suggested 
take out or change that you had to fight for, or did you feel like you had complete freedom with this film? No, no, no. We we made this movie and the scope you saw for nineteen point five million dollars. Oh. And that's why, you know what you get? You get a shitload of freedom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because you go, no. <laughs> I'm not listening. You know, but in reality, the collaboration with Fox Searchlight has been a complete dream. Because there was never that conversation. There was one thing we, on the initial conversation, when I, before we even met with Vanessa, when I took them through the story, we finished the pitch, uh, and, and we were all teary-eyed and moved. And I said, one more thing, it's in black and white. <laughs> and they said, black and white 16.5, color 19.5, I go, color it is. <laughs> and, and, and then what you do is you color, color the movie to make the color part of the storytelling. You know, that's, that's, a, that's something Fellini said once and I took to heart. I mean, the color is so amazing in this film. I'm glad you did it that way. I'm glad I did it because look, the fact is, you it's, it's like a poker game. You come in with a few chips that you're gonna sacrifice. <laughs> that was like, yeah, you can go either way. <laughs> then you look reasonable. <laughs> He's so reasonable, that man. <laughs> so tell me about collaboration. Uh, how do you know you found someone to write with that it's gonna work and it's gonna create something better than you would by yourself? Um, well, well, honestly, I, I'm not entirely the right person to answer this because I, I truly feel like I came into this situation as someone who, you know, as I said, you had such a full vision of what you wanted and so I was just, well, at first, honestly, I thought, maybe I'm here for vernacular English. <laughs> and then I read Guillermo's dialogue and was like, no, maybe I'm here. Anyway, but I, I, uh, I sort of ended up feeling like, and I don't know, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I ended up intuiting that what would make me a good collaborator would be to not get too tied up in the details of, would this actually happen, or what should happen on page 35, or, but rather to sort of say, okay, we're telling this fairy tale, we're in this particular fantasy, what would I love to see? What would be beautiful? What would be exciting? What would have to do with these characters that he's bringing? And to just say, he has that kind of freedom, I will give it to myself as well, and hope that I will bring something to the party that could be helpful and additive. I think that uh, the collaborating is exactly like any other relationship. What you are, what you need is not me, you know? <laughs> Uh, is, uh, uh, because then A, you're not alone, and B, you're fascinated by another point of view. And I think sameness, if two people agree on everything, one, one is extra. One should leave the room. You know, you don't need that person. So I, I need somebody that has a strong point of view, that is a terrific writer, which Vanessa is, and that can defend what she thinks is fair and needed, and, and then even if you arrive to a third solution, a dark horse solution, uh, if you arrive there only because there was this ping pong, you know? I think it's, it's, it's a, I find that the most horrible thing in the world is a blank page. Horrible, because you're so alone and there's this thing that won't talk to you. It's like going to church when, when you're in need and then you come out and nothing has been solved. <laughs> you pray to that page and you pray to that page and then when you have a partner, uh, you know, you learn as much from, because they are brave and attempt something and then you go, no, 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 what about this? And it's beautiful. I think uh, the thing, that, the, the way I like to collaborate, which is rare, is we talk a lot in the beginning and after that we send each other things. And I say, be ruthless. And we don't meet again. I just say, destroy it. You know, and, and, and she destroyed it. And then I go, oh my God, you didn't like that? <laughs> you know? But, but, but you, you, you then listen to someone, why didn't you like that? Why do you think it was not necessary? But I, I think that's great. That, that takes away the loneliness of the process. And you mentioned the terrifying blank page, and I know we have a lot of writers in the audience, so what is your secret to fighting writer's block? Well, I think there's, two different questions here. I think the fear of the blank page is a little bit different in my mind from writer's block. Sometimes for me, writer's block is about 
I really want to write something fantastic. And if I can't write anything fantastic, I just won't write anything. And then I end up just sitting there. Um, whereas the blank page, I think to myself, well, words would be better than not words. And if they're bad, I could rewrite them. So if I could simply turn off the editor and write something, I'll be ahead. So I'll just do that. So I try to divide it into two parts. I honestly think we are all very different. Every writer has a solution. I, I've learned to respect every, every process. I mean, I think that what I do is I circle and circle and circle and circle and circle. Mm -hmm. And then finally when it goes and I know, I feel it, it comes complete. Mm -hmm. I've heard uh, 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 some writers talk about that. Mm -hmm. And they say, I composed yesterday in three minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's sort of similar. There's something that doesn't fit and everything is work for a writer. You, and I mean it, I, for those of you that are married to a writer, be patient, because everything that you're reading, a magazine at the barber shop is part of your work. You're walking around a, a park, you, you're thinking, you're, we are like magpies that steal from the real world and bring it to our nest. I don't know, for example, the final poem of the film, uh, I was on the, on the, it was originally another poem, and I was I was one hour. I'm always arrived one hour earlier to the set than anybody. And we were already shooting in the university, and I arrived an hour earlier than my hour earlier. And I, they said, "What do you want to do?" I said, "Let's find a bookstore." And I go to a bookstore and I find that poem mm. in a in a book I open and I said, "That's the end of the movie." So you you never know where it's going to come from. You really don't. Uh, what I do think is uh, a writer has the duty to live, uh, not just write, and not just watch, and not just read, but live, because life informs you as much, if not more, than literature easily. And uh, we've got a few minutes for questions from the audience. I don't know if we have a microphone, so you'll have to just project. Um, is there in the third row? Uh, thanks. Yeah, what a wonderful movie. Thanks. Um, the, uh, the writing seems so meticulous and so exacting. Uh, I wonder, you talked about freedom. What kind of flexibility do you have when you're on the set uh, with your actors? And, and, and how, do, how, what, how does that flexibility look? Uh, well, you know, I think that what you do is imagine you prepare perfectly in order to improvise. Mm. I think that you need to, you know, you need to believe uh, we are an embassy on one side of the Atlantic, the audience is another embassy on the other side of the Atlantic, and the actor is the ambassador. He's going to deliver or she's going to deliver to the audience. And, and you know, it, it happens to us as writers, when a great actor delivers our lines, we go, oh my, I'm a great writer. <laughs> when a bad actor delivers the same lines, you go, oh, I'm a terrible writer. So, you know, you're in their hands at any rate. And then what I like to do is, is be intuitive with them. Like, for example, uh, I can tell Sally, uh, when Richard looks at his watch, slap his hand and don't tell him. And that brings reality to the scene and it's not scripted. Or, or uh, I was with Richard and I said, uh, when you say, is he a god? I don't know, he ate a cat. You know, that was improvised on the, on the, at the moment. Or, I, or at the end of the scene, look at Sally and say, interesting guy. <laughs> Uh, and those are things you find on the set because what you get that you didn't get when you were writing alone is the vibrancy of the actor. It's the specific colors, you know? And, and when you are with an actor on a set, you, uh, if you come in as a writer and director and you just know you want purple, and this guy is coming with a bag full of fabrics of every color, every sheen, you're gonna not examine 300 beautiful fabrics because you want purple? No, you let the actor do whatever they want, listen, make your dialogue malleable, and then if it's not working, you go, let's do it the way it's written. But if it's working, you go, good. You know, so it's really, uh, you know, you need to exist in a world where other people may have a better idea than you, <laughs> which is a real world, by the way. <laughs> Great, anyone else? Uh, over here? Yeah. Um, I've been watching the trailer ten times a day, and I love the movie. Thank you. Um, I wonder, was there ever any 
anything you asked Sally Hawkins to do that she didn't want to do? And, that, and how did you convince her? Well, uh, Sally, Sally is a, an actor of great power, immense power and immense fragility. You know, she's both uh, an incredible powerhouse, I think is, she's a phenomenal presence. She has a luminosity. The movie was, the entirety of the project was the juxtaposition of the extraordinary and the ordinary. You know, can we have an ancient god living in a bathtub? Can they have sex and then talk about it the next day with her friend? You know, like you would after you have sex <laughs> and you have a coffee. And and and, 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 and and I thought Sally was that juxtaposition. Sally is both extraordinary and and somebody you believe you could see in a bus bench. So when when there was a moment in the movie where she was uh, I was already prepared as director, the musical number. She had rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and on the day, it's very difficult. You you have 50 musicians and in walks a fisherman. <laughs> and it's very difficult not to be self-conscious. So I say to the musicians, I'm sure this is the weirdest gig you've ever been booked for. <laughs> but I also went to Sally immediately and, and she was really nervous and I said, uh, I hugged Sally and I hugged Doug, and we huddled like football players. And I said to them, how many times are we going to have the chance to make a musical? Mm. I said, this is our afternoon. Enjoy it. Nothing can go wrong. And everything went away. All the fear evaporated. Other than that, I think that what I think Sally has is that unique and most beautiful of uh, qualities an actor has, which is fragility and fearlessness. You know, she's not afraid to go anywhere. And that is, that is essential. All right, I think we've got time for one more audience question. That guy. That guy. <laughs> that guy. Okay. Given your inspiration for the movie, were there any issues you had with litigation and competing studios saying that's our creature? No, because the, the creature, a point, a point of inspiration, a point of inspiration. The DNA is very different. You know, I mean, the DNA of the of that monster is going to be there no matter what. If you make a giant ape movie, the DNA of King Kong will exist there. But it's not the creature. It's not the creature from the lagoon. The the origin is completely different. There's the oil rigs, blah blah. The design is completely different. Otherwise, we wouldn't have spent three years making one. And, and the story is entirely different. And if they can prove that the creature has gotten laid with anyone in the history of those movies, I may, I may consider something. But it was never, it was never that. Uh, and and, and the, the beauty of that is I feel that uh, the, univers the universality of the symbol of these monsters uh, makes them malleable. You know, makes them malleable and they can transform and change. Uh, I've done two movies before uh, with an amphibian man in a super secret government facility, you know. So, you know, uh, we exist in a realm of ideas. And the only truth that you can bring as an artist is your voice and your synthesis of those ideas. You're not going to, you're always going to be walking on a line somebody else has walked. You know, mm -hmm. the synthesis of what you do, the synthesis of the extraordinary and the ordinary, the sacred and the profane, the beautiful and the terrible, whatever is your voice that comes as much from your flaws and your defects as it comes from your qualities that are the same thing. That's the difference. And I think uh, then what you are is unique. The, you know, what, what I think we do with art, there's an, a, a Japanese art called Tintsugi, which is the, the fact that when a piece of pottery, precious piece of pottery breaks, the, men, the mending of the piece is not to try to minimize the cracks, but to make them salient. And the patching of the piece is done with gold. And, and the beauty of the piece is after that, not the original pieces, but the way they were put together with the fractures that make it unique, and I think that's art. Mm. That's probably a good 
no to wrap it up on. So thank you guys for joining us. And thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.